Welcome, Marvels, to the show. How are you? Hi, Dana. How's it going? I'm good, Gwen. How are you doing? Hey, good. Um, so, Dana, I'm, I'm I'm about to giggle because yeah, because we always start, start laughing. Things. This is really how we do it. Dana, um, we got to talk about something that just keeps on coming up, keeps on coming up, keeps on coming up, and we so we're going to talk about it. We want to talk about autism and women. Yeah, yeah. And more importantly, how often people in our field miss or misdiagnose. I mean, I really feel like I had just have to start ragging on our field. Mm -hmm. Honestly, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, and the medical really, psychology yeah. and medical. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, autism in women, girls, females, female uh, assigned at birth, however you say it is um is the is the reason i started awake in the first place right <clears throat> so for me and we tend to see obviously females women girls getting diagnosed later in life cuz they get missed um but more importantly so we have to sort of start at the diagnostic criteria and the whole kind of history of the dsm so the dsm was it in like 2013 that they collapsed Asperger's, Asperger's? Used, yeah, we used to be Asperger's yeah. into this larger autism spectrum disorder diagnostic category. And they say, the reason they say they did that was statistically, they found clinicians were not diagnosed. They weren't parsing um, autism out from Asperger's enough to really warrant a separate diagnosis. So they collapsed those in. And then they also changed the, they used to have like the functional levels, high, medium, and low. They were these really marginalizing named levels of functioning. And now they have um, level of care that you need, level one, level two, level three, in support. terms of, yeah, yeah, yeah level of support. Um, mm -hmm. So, which is fine. I mean, the, moving in the right direction. And I want to be really clear for our listeners too. The DSM is not psychologist land. This is something that's done by the medical community. It's psychiatrists that do the DSM. So we adhere to that. Interestingly, the ICD, which is the International Diagnostic Code thingy list, still mm -hmm. has Asperger's in it, which is really interesting. So they actually did what the DSM did too. And they said, oh yeah, okay, we'll go along with that. And, and the autism label will still have these three support needs, but you can still diagnose Asperger's, which is really interesting to me, right? Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I, I digress. Um, I think they've done it disservice for many reasons. Uh, taking the Asperger's label out has made it even harder for people who have low support needs to get diagnosed. In a way, Asperger's, people had in mind what it was, you know, the stereotypical card of computer nerd who didn't make eye contact and couldn't get a girl. I'm talking about guy, you know, like the things we see depicted in movies. Um, but women could also be Asperger's. Now we've talked on the show before too, that almost every autism measure that's out there, the assessment tools are all normed. Well, first of all, they're developed and normed on children to begin with. And even yeah. if they are developed for adults, they really are. And we, when we say normed, we mean like um, the statistical analysis of the items they use to make sure that they're reliable and valid, that they actually measure what they say they're gonna measure are all done on the symptoms and, and tr attributes and traits you tend to see in boys and men. So girls and women get missed. We have, we've also talked on the show about how girls tend to mask more. Um, girls are yeah. pressed to mask more and sort of be socially belonging. And there's, I've read some research that girls sort of more um, uh, inherently do that as well. So there's probably a mix of both of those. Um, and boys do tend to be, there's all this attribution bias with teachers and parents and everything. Boys, when they're having those kinds of behaviors like stimming or rocking and things like that, they get tolerated more in boys than girls and girls are like, sit up and don't do that and yada, yada. So there's all this pressure to, uh, mask or, or hide those symptoms much earlier. 
So what, not, what ends up happening is you've got so a girl in school who is suffering and uh, or suffering outside of school, but schools when often these times these things are picked up, right? They go to get assessed and they don't say it's either ADHD or um, autism, just gets missed. What I see is adults, and I, you know, I have several social media platforms. I'm posting memes and informationals on there, and people are telling me their horror stories. Things like an actual assessor. So this is an actual psychologist doing an assessment. Some neuropsychologists, which really, I just, I know I can't swear on here, but I just, Arr! you, well, Dina, <laughs> you can't. I, I just, I just. I now know out. how to edit it out. Okay. I actually know how to edit. Thank you, Dana, for giving me that opportunity to learn that skill. I have had people <laughs> tell me, I had someone tell me yesterday, the neuropsychologist went over all the testing with her. She said she's very high on all the ADHD measures, all, very high on all the autism measures, but she makes too much eye contact to be autistic, which by the way, isn't even a diagnostic. That's how I don't even think that's in the DSM which girls tend to do more, we're socially pressed to do that. And by the way, America is really the only culture that does that. Almost every other culture in the world, it's rude and weird to make eye contact the entire time you're talking to someone. So you make too much eye contact. He said you uh, did too well in school as a kid. She was in the gifted program, which is really common for girls. And this, she's too, she was too into uh, sci-fi stuff and fantasy. <laughs> and I'm, I'm like, but wait, shouldn't that really be like a diagnostic I, indicator? Actually, that is a diagnostic, <laughs> that is a diagnostic criteria. <laughs> I mean, we laugh about it. Oh. But I was like, I wanted to jump through my computer and grab that poor woman and, well, just hold her and hug her if that weren't the thing I shouldn't do as an doctor. But I was just, I was enraged. This is someone who waited a year and a half to get into for an assessment. Um, I asked her if she could get a second opinion, but the problem is now her insurance is paid for the initial assessment. Insurance of course, isn't going to pay for her to go somewhere no. else. So no. this continues to just be this. I mean, this is the the drum I beat uh, over and over and over, and I am angry and dumbfounded about how many people in our field do not understand and have not educated themselves about how different girls and women look. And for that matter, yeah. what we used to call higher functioning men, but people that don't have support needs. What's really interesting is you, you probably know the statistic. It's something like 80 plus percent of folks that are diagnosed with autism are unemployed or can't hold mm -hmm. full-time work. I really mm -hmm. think that that stat is skewed a little bit because they're not measuring people who can work full time. They're not bloody diagnosing people who can work yeah. full time. I would guess that if we start, I'm just like totally activated. Go. If we, if we were still, if we were still diagnosing people with Asperger's and people were actually being diagnosed, I would imagine those numbers might go down. And I don't say that to, to demean or dismiss people who, who can't work full time. I totally get it. But I think they've really done a disservice. And I think then people are like, well, I can work. I, I pay a major hit for it. I come home, I'm exhausted. Mm -hmm. I'm really lucky in that my work schedule is so varied that I've figured out a way in my almost 60 years now on how to do it and be able to, to juggle it. If I had to work a 40 hour week where I was there all the time, I, yeah. I don't think I could do it. But all these stats and all these presses of people doing real damage out there by missing people and marginalizing them and then someone says, okay, well, I've done all this research on myself and I really thought this was true. And then the supposed expert says, oh no, you make too much eye contact. I just want to kill myself or go find that person and, you know, blow up their car. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying that laughingly. I'm not, this is not a real threat. I just put a little note this on not, there. This, 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 this is Dana, this is Dana activated and angry. Oh, damn. So and I tell people too, like for me, when I'm assessing someone and one of the first things they do is sort of sheepishly and shyly say, well, can I send you like stuff I've written down that I think is, yes, I, please. I identify with. And then they email it to me and it's like this seven page single spaced manifesto. Yeah. I'm yeah. like, that's diagnostic, you know? So there is this sort of weird power and privilege thing that happens in our field where I'm the expert 
And it doesn't matter what you bring me. And then, of course, there's this idea of, oh, it's so faddish and people are on TikTok and they see these symptoms and they want to be autistic. Who the hell would want to be autistic? If I could choose right now to go ting and not be autistic, I would do it in a heartbeat, which is different than being gay. I think that like I like being gay. It's this is not fun. Now, that said, there are. Yes. There are things on social media I see where people are like, if you have, if you are these five things, you're probably autistic. And I'm like, that's pretty irresponsible. That's really not, there's more to it than that. But what happens then is they throw the baby out with the bathwater and they say, oh, these kids are seeing this stuff on social media and they're running with this, you know, this fad and being ADHD or being autistic is just a sort of fad. Yes, there are bad things out there and people probably are identifying with, but people that I know and hear about that are really just seeking answers and want to understand themselves, they're not just going along with one three minute video they saw. They are doing yeah. years of research and they're yeah. trying to read about themselves and they're reading books and they're, you know, highlighting the entire book because everything pertains to them. They get it more than the assessors do, right? I find people that are adults who are seeking these answers know more about it oftentimes than the assessors do. Now, you and I are different because we're specializing in this and we know that. Mm. But I just really want to put that, I mean, I want to put a call out there for people that are in our field or are missing this. Please learn some about this because you're really playing with people's lives here. And people that are seeking assessment, uh, other than saying, um, I think this is the reason why self-assessment within the community is so valid because yeah. so many people get misdiagnosed and they're like, dude, no, I know you, you are totally autistic. Right. And then the, our profession is like, oh, you shouldn't be self-diagnosing. That's terrible. Well, they know more about it than you do. Why wouldn't they? Right. Yeah. So, okay. I mean, I mean, Dana, like, I mean, what do we know? You know, mm -hmm. measures, and this is something that we, you know, Dana and I learn in school, right? In, in grad school, mm -hmm. which is you got to look at your normed one, the, the population that the test was normed on in the first place. Yeah. Um, and, you know, at the time that the gold standard, so the ADOS and the ADI were normed, you know, the, the ratio of men to women that, that were diagnosed. Yeah. 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 I might have even been. 10, Dana. I mean, like back then, I, I mean, That's I can relook at that. By the way, I did fact check the when Asperger's left the DSM and it was 2013. So you were close. It was 13. But I, okay. I, did, I did fact oh, check. Oh, I said 2013. It. I think that was what Oh, I said. you did? Oh, yeah. okay. Sorry. Okay. You're right. Um, And, you know, I think that we need to look at that. More importantly, though, I think the the, the piece here is if there's something that isn't fitting for you and you are searching for what or why and you mm -hmm. do all this research um, and you've done your own due diligence on it, mm -hmm. right? If you're going to go and get formal assessment because you need it, let's say you need it because you need to work within the system to get services and support. Yeah. Because that's yeah. the only reason why you would do that, right? Yep. Yep. Um. Or maybe, you know, some people want a peace of mind. I don't know. Like what, what, for or their family, their family won't believe them. So they have to, that's their way no, of getting true. validity. So their family will finally believe them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If you're going to reach out to an assessor and you say to that assessor, Hey, I need a formal assessment in this. I've mm -hmm. been questioning this. Would you be open to hearing and seeing what I have done already yeah. in this? If that assessor says, no, that's okay. No, I'll, I'll take care of it. Yeah. Don't yeah. go see that assessor. Exactly. Like, don't do it. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Um, however, if your assessor says, Ab absolutely, mm -hmm. let's look at that together. What have you discovered? Like, yeah. let me understand where you're coming from. You know, that is, you know, just that off the, I mean, out of, off, out of the gate, I feel like working with someone that is that is not going to diminish yeah, it's a good indicator. Yeah. It's a good uh, indicator, right? Yeah. Like in general, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, here's the other thing too, Dana, is um, I think the thing that some of my clients really struggle with is they spend all their energy masking, right? I'm going to yeah. make eye contact. I'm going to have a conversation. I'm going to hold myself mm -hmm. together. I'm going to mm -hmm. look good 
be good, whatever, yeah, to yeah. the neuro majority, whatever, yeah. like the definition of that is for the neuro majority. Yeah. And then I'm slammed when I get home. I, I, yeah. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm exhausted. It's not something I can maintain. At what point do we say to that person, well, you're not disabled enough because yeah. you can mask. Yeah. So yeah. It's crazy. Not, you know, yeah. how, like yeah. this doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> yeah. If we, if but we but use an analogy, happens. yeah, if we use an this analogy for that, like, okay, so I'm learning to ride a bike and I can say, you can't ride it. If I push you down a hill, so all you have to do is Sorry. hold on. You don't have to like pedal because it's harder to balance when you're. Oh, right I thought you pedaling. just wanted to push me down the hill. Oh, okay, it was funny. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding, Dana. Okay, okay. That's what that masking all day reminds me of. Like, like, okay. So, are you a good bike rider? Can you motor up a hill, or can you pedal and and balance at the same time? Versus just holding on for dear life and going down a hill. That's what masking feels like to me. So yeah, I can hold mm. on for the amount of time it takes to go down the hill, but I, that doesn't mean I'm an expert bike rider, right? I can't get up a hill or I can't do it while I'm actually pedaling. I was also also trying to think of analogies that are like medical analogies around that. Most of mm. us, if we absolutely have to, like if you have a blood test or something, you can go 12 hours without eating. It's murderous, right? Like if I have to have those blood tests, I always get them first thing in the morning because if I have to go day hours without eating, I'm gonna kill somebody. <laughs> <laughs> Playing really aggressive today. I'm gonna kill somebody. I know. Wow. Um, <laughs> I was watching a lot of hockey this week. Um, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's that idea of even in medicine, though. Like you'll have you'll have physicians that will not be amenable to your own research, and that should be a red flag too. Like my doctors have been very collaborative. I got diagnosed with. Um, adrenal insufficiency. And that was mostly all of my research. I said to the doctor, could it be this? She's like, well, that's really rare, but let's test for it. And she's like, oh my God, this is it. I'm like, I've spent years researching this, right? Um, the autism thing, uh, uh, my EDS diagnosis, I'm the first one that said, I think this really fits. And then went to a doctor like, yeah, dude, this is, of course. So you, if you, yeah, if you have a physician or a, uh, someone who's going to assess you, says, yes, bring your stuff. I would love to hear about it you're gonna help me in this assessment. They're also gonna be experts enough to know that the actual measures they give you, we never give just one measure. We are trained, if you're gonna test anything, you don't just give one test, you give a multitude of tests. We call that a testing battery. You wanna see if that, if that data converges, right? And if you ask someone, do you know what autism looks like in girls and women? And they say, oh, it's the same as everything, don't go. If they say, yes, I actually do, they're gonna know how to temper those tests. Like that, when I give those measures, I give a masking measure and I give the big five personality test because it's super easy to give, it doesn't take forever. And that'll show you like measures of what's called agreeableness and some impression management. And every time I test a woman, those come up really high, which tells me, oh, they're, they're, they wanna look good, they're masking. And so the things that I see on the other tests are, are actually probably a little, the symptoms are probably higher than they're actually telling me, right? Yep. Those are things that we learn as assessors, but you have to know to look for those things. And there's dark histories with all kinds of psychological assessments. You, one of the first things they taught us in our intelligence uh, testing class was the dark history of how they used to say that African-Americans weren't as smart as white people because they'd give the same test to white people and African-Americans and African-Americans wouldn't do as well. Well, duh, all the questions had to do with things that white people learned in school. Mm -hmm. you know. And we call those racially biased tests. So we really should be calling these other ones like neurodivergent bias, bias tests or male skewed or missing some of these symptoms and things like that, right? Yep. And I get as much information for my purposes from clinical interview and history. I get almost more information from that than I oh, do yeah. from the actual tests. Yeah, I will say like clinical interviewing and time with yeah. someone yeah. 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 is always more valuable. Yeah. Like yeah. The, the, the standardized measures are there, I think – for us to professionally do our due diligence based right. on what is recommended by our practice. 
Yeah. But I will say even when I'm, you know, in my assessments, in part of my assessment when I'm doing, I, cause I don't, I don't do diagnostics anymore, but mm-hmm. I do transition mm-hmm. assessments. You know, mm-hmm. I meet the team at them all and we have lunch together. Oh. And I will tell you that is the most valuable yeah. hour. Yeah. More yeah, yeah. than the 15 measures that I send out to teachers and parents that I have to, I really have to because yeah. it, it, they, they, they are standardized ways for us to measure support and behavior. I mean, like uh, blah, 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 blah. And that's what they but, want. They're looking for that. Yeah. 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 And it's, and it's required. I mean, it's a required part. So I get yeah. it. That's a hoop, yeah. but man, the clinical piece, and this is what actually I think you pay for mm-hmm. is clinical judgment. Yeah. Yeah. It's not whether you scored above 60 on this T score for this measure mm-hmm. or whether, you know, you, um, you know, I don't know whether, you know, you you fall outside of the range of nor I'm whatever it is at the end of the day, you're relying on a clinician yeah, and their critical thinking, the right. framework for how they think, yeah. how they've come to the conclusion and, you know, I don't think that people come into this situation and then want to question that professional. I mean, some people do. Mm-hmm. They they like to do that. But no, it's I'm really saying hard. most don't yeah. do that. Yeah. Most would yeah. not say, how did you discover this? I know you explained it to me, but I'm still not sure. I'm, I, I still am like, this really doesn't fit. It doesn't resonate with me. It doesn't match mm-hmm. how I'm feeling mm-hmm. inside, you know, whatever that is. Yeah. And, you know, as clinicians, we're like, this might be new information, but does it resonate with you? Does yeah, this make you, sense to you? Absolutely. When you even mentioned like meeting you at a mall for lunch, mm-hmm. I stopped breathing for a few minutes. I'm, I'm like, oh my God, okay, a mall. Do I know where it is? What's it going to be uh-huh. like in the mall? I mm-hmm. have to eat in front of this person. Oh my God, I have all these food issues. So I'm going to have to talk to you. I'm going to talk to this person. I don't know. That's sort of like a, and then also I'd be like, I'm not doing it. I'm not going to do it. I'm, I'm just going to not do it. Right. I mean, that even saying, meet me at a mall for lunch. Uh huh. And that, which, alone. And that happens. <laughs> I'll, I say, to, I say to the family and I say to the teen, I say, you know, I like to do this if you can. Oh yeah. yeah and I yeah. say what, what I do. And yeah. I'm like, Oh no, no. I'm like, tell me why. <laughs> like it, you don't have to do it, well, but tell yeah. me why. No, I love that. That is I mean, I'm telling you, the yes and the no give me equal amounts of information. Yeah, yeah. Um, or when a parent goes, "Ooh, I don't think that's going to work," and I'll be like, "Why? Ooh, tell me, tell yeah. me why." Like, so you yeah. know, this type of thing though, this is what is giving me the information. And yeah. Yeah. you know, nowhere in the DSM. I mean, does the DSM talk about sensory pieces? Mm-hmm. Kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Kind only in repetitive actions. That's yeah. it. But yep. it does not talk about sensory registration, right. Right. how the person takes information from the outside world in, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? And then on my show, I had um, Dr. Valisak on to talk about interoception mm-hmm. um, and how OTs define interoception, well, and, you know, and what they do to promote interoception. Right. Um, and that is where I think a lot of the pieces are it's really in this idea of like yeah 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 they they become so second nature that people don't even necessarily know they're doing it and i think that's some of what goes on when people are going on tiktok and they're like oh my god i so relate to that you mean other people do that because it would never be something that they would just say oh i do this thing it might emerge in therapy. I can remember I was in therapy for probably over two years before I told my therapist, oh, I do this weird thing in my head where I do the symmetrical counting thing along with my breathing. And it's always when I'm nervous and I've had some weird social thing. And I remember like, she's going to think I'm crazy. And she was the first human I ever told it to. And that was way before I knew I was autistic, but she was like, oh yeah, okay. I'm really glad you told me that. Is that something I would have gone into a therapist telling? There was so much shame associated with it, and I and I didn't. Yeah. It didn't even dawn on me that that would be something that person should probably know, right? Yeah. And so these tests aren't asking things like that, 
you know, and I've yeah. talked with a lot of my students about, we need to develop a measure that asks more of these things. In fact, some of what I'm doing just started with some of my graduate students is can we go through like all these platforms that I've had up for years and can we do like thematic analyses from what people are saying to get better yes. questions to yes. grab folks that have masked all yes. those years. So let's come up with an yes. assessment that actually asks these things. Right, right. right. E e and and to, to do that, it doesn't have to be standardized. It can be in the context of a clinical interview. Exactly. Yeah. Like yesterday on TikTok, I just mentioned how hard the quiet meditation is for autistic folks. Oh, yeah. No, I never, was, I never, ever recommend quiet meditation. Ever, yeah. And everybody ever. was like, oh my God. Yes, 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 yes. yes. I mean, it just like ever. the amount of comments. I was like, oh, hit a chord here. So me, yeah. yeah, I think that should be something we should ask about. Have yeah. I never, ever. Yeah. It's totally it contraindicated. Is, yeah. It's contraindicated. And what it does is it leaves the mind open for yeah. an onslaught of thoughts. <laughs> and they're not always good. And then I'm like, I'm doing it wrong. No. So everybody no. does what I would no. do. They're like, oh yeah, doing art or gardening or yeah. at, like a lot of people crochet Active. and knit. Active meditation. It. It's almost, and that's a repetitive sort of thing, yes. but it's not the typical repetitive thing that we're used to measuring from these tests. Yeah. Right. No, that's no, what no, we're no, trying no. to get at. It's, it's the thing but it's the thing from a slightly different perspective and our testing yeah. when people don't know what to look for, isn't capturing it. And it yeah, makes absolutely. me lose my mind. Yeah. You know, and, and you guys, I think there's this piece. So the other, the other part of my, of my brain goes to this place where people can go to, which is um, diagnosis shopping. Mm -hmm. Um, and for those of you out there that, that don't know that it's when someone goes from person to person, from, from professional to professional, to professional, to professional mm -hmm. until they get the diagnosis that they want. Yeah. It's like meditation think, seeking that for diagnosing. Yeah. Right. Right. And I think mm -hmm. that that is, this is where some people go to in their minds when they're, when it's like, no, get a second on it. Yeah. Well, one, it's like, well, I just spent all my money on the first, so I can't get the mm -hmm. second. Um, yeah. Right. But this is not what this is. Um, and I get it. And, you know, even, even the diagnosis shopping, there is still something for that person that is unanswered. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and maybe there it's like, what is the attachment to this diagnosis in particular? What does this mean about me? And helping to uncover that and, and find out what that is instead of just like smacking a negative label or a pejorative yeah. label on that. Yeah. But yeah. that, but I think some, some people that do the self-diagnosis that are seeking the formal diagnosis, they can, sometimes they can come off as that too, Dana. Oh so, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. they're really just looking for answers. They just really yes. want to be understood because they haven't been understood yet. Yeah. And maybe yeah. the answers of why the why the diagnosis was ruled out, yeah, wasn't yeah. fully disclosed or explained properly by the professional. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's or another something like piece. you like fantasy novels and sci-fi. So uh, that's ridiculous. If anything, it's like you know what should go on the questionnaire. Do you like do do you do you like the idea of going to Comic Con? Yes, I like the idea, but I would never go because it's too, it's too busy. Right, it's too no, loud, too much going on. Yeah, I, yeah, exactly, exactly. Do do you do you have a special? You know, do you do do does your passion for certain actors change every month based on the sci-fi anime? Yeah, <laughs> you see. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, yeah, and then, yeah, it's little things like I haven't seen anything on these measures that um, talks about like mimicry or like another post that I had last week was like when you meet new people, it's almost like I call them these work crushes and like temporarily or for a long time adopting mannerisms of that person. And I think it really is sort of a way of mirroring or scripting. And everybody's yeah. like, this is a thing. Other people do this too. And I'm like, yeah, that's not in the diagnostic criteria anywhere. Oh, I know. And it's so I know. common men and women to do that. It's crazy. Yeah. 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 It's, um, it's, it's just a high, you know, the, the really autism, it really has become quite a, an umbrella. Yeah. And it's almost too much of an umbrella Yeah, in terms of people that are assessing for it or looking for one thing and one thing only. Right. 
Yeah. yeah. And if it doesn't fit that, that yes, neat little thing, they're going to say, no, it's, it's not a thing. Yeah. <laughs> the umbrella is only a one person umbrella. One, it's, yeah. It's, it's a one person. <laughs> the rest of you, too bad. You're out of the rain. The rest of you have to stand in the rain. Sorry. Uh, too bad for you. you know. Sorry. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, it's crazy. Oh my god. Crazy. Yeah. Oh my god. Well, okay. So, um gosh, you know, like takeaway points you guys is it's okay to do your own research and to challenge people mm-hmm. when it doesn't resonate with how you understand yourself. Yes. Um, the, and I know it depends on what country you're in, yeah. how you get in the system. If you're in the US, I highly recommend um googling Psychology Today, they have a therapist search, uh, therapist search tool that you mm-hmm. can look by specialty and then even then do what Gwen is saying, like ask them, if I bring in a bunch of my own data, are you amenable to that? And are you mm-hmm. familiar with diagnosis in women and adults and you know, everything and else? Yeah. 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 Are you are you familiar with uh, not only diagnosis with women and adults, but um, where... Um, the diagnosis is much, much later than you would ever imagine. Yeah, late diagnosis, masking, right? All, that stuff. all yeah, of that stuff, exactly. masking. Like those are good mm-hmm. questions to ask. And yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. you know, yeah, Dana. If Dana gets another post about this, she might. Im- she might explode. I, I might. <laughs> If she reads my another post. she'll be working in the kitchen and I'll come in there. And I'm like, ah. she's like, oh yeah. Okay. Another one of those. Yeah. <laughs> what happened on TikTok? Okay. Yeah. Uh, Dana, you're, you're, you're quite, I mean, you're, you're like a TikTok. Is that what you, do you call you TikTokers? A no. TikToker? I, yeah. I don't, oh, they call them creators, which is sort of fun. I'm a creator. I like oh. that better. Yeah. Okay. We'll call you a creator then. Creator. It's like Prince. It's just like one one yeah, label. Yeah, there you go. Creator. Okay, anyway. All right. All right, Marvels. Um, we will see you in the next episode. Bye. Bye, everybody.